The gods, meanwhile, had sat down for a conference with Zeus in the Hall of the Golden Floor. The Lady Hebe, acting as their cupbearer, served them with nectar, and they drank each other's health from tankards of gold as they looked out on the city of Troy. By way of tormenting Hiri, the son of Cronos opened in a sarcastic vein. Two of the goddesses, he slyly observed, are on Menlius' side, Hire of Argos and Boeotian Athene. But I note that they sit idly here and are content to watch, whereas laughter-loving Aphrodite always keeps close to Paris and shields him from calamity. Only a moment ago she whisked him off when he thought his end had come. Nevertheless, victory has certainly gone to Menlius' favorite of Ares, and it remains for us to consider what shall happen next. Are we to stir up this wicked strife again with all the sound and fury of war? Or shall we make the Trojans and Achaeans friends? Subject to your approval, this would mean the King Priam, his city, would survive and Menlius take archive Helen back. This speech drew muttered protest from Athene and Hiri, who were sitting together plotting evil for the Trojans. However, Athene held her tongue, for all her annoyance with her father Zeus. She made no rejoinder, though she seethed with indignation. But Hiri could not contain her rage and burst into speech. Dread son of Kronos, what you propose is monstrous. How can you think of making all my labor null and void? The pains I took, the sweat that poured from me while my horses toiled around as I was gathering the clans to make trouble for Priam and his sons. Do as you please, but do not imagine that all the rest of us approve. Zeus the Cloud Gatherer fiercely resented this. Madam, he said, What injury can Priam and his sons have done you to account for the vehemence of your desire to sack the lovely town of Troy? Will nothing satisfy your malice but to storm the gates and the long walls and eat up Priam and his sons and all his people raw? Act as you see fit. I do not wish this difference of ours to grow into a serious breach. But there is one condition that I make. Remember it. When it is my turn to desire the downfall of a town, and I choose one where friends of yours are living, make no attempt to curb my anger, but let me have my way, since I have given in to you this time of my own accord, though much against my inclination. For all the cities that men live in under the sun and starry sky, the nearest to my heart was holy Ilium, with Priam and the people of Priam of the good ashen spear. Never at their banquets did my altar go without its proper share of wine and fat, the offerings that we claim as ours. The three towns I love best, the Oxide Queen of Heaven replied, are Argos, Sparta, and Massini of the Broad Streets. Sack those if ever they become obnoxious to you. I shall not grudge you their destruction, nor make a stand on their behalf. Even if I do object and meddle with your plans, I shall achieve nothing. You are far too strong for me. And yet, my enterprises ought not to be thwarted any more than yours. For I too am divine, and our parentage is one. Of all the children of Cronus, of the crooked ways, I take precedence both by right of birth and because I am your consort, and you are king of all the gods. However, let us yield to one another in this matter. I to you, and you to me, and the rest of the immortal gods will follow us. All I ask you to do now is to tell Athene to visit the front and arrange for the Trojans to break the truce by an act of aggression against the triumphant Achaeans. The father of men and gods did not demur, and at once made his wishes clear to Athene. Off with you to the front. Visit the armies and contrive to make the Trojans break the truce by attacking the Achaeans in their triumph. With this encouragement, Athene, who had already set her heart on action, sped down from the peaks of Olympus. Like a meteor that is flung by Zeus as a warning to sailors or some great army on the land, and comes through the sky, blazing and tossing out innumerable sparks. 
Thus Pallas Athena flashed down to the earth and leapt into their midst. Horse-taming Trojans and Achaean men-at-arms were awestruck at the sight. Every man looked at his neighbor with a question on his lips. Does this mean war again, with all its horror? Or is Zeus our judge in battle, making peace between us? While the Trojans and Achaeans were asking each other what was coming, Athene disguised herself as a man and slipped into the Trojan ranks in the likeness of a sturdy spearman called Laudocus, son of Antenor. She was trying to find the stalwart and admirable Pandarus, like Aeon's son, wherever he might be, and she succeeded. Prince Pandarus was standing there beside the powerful shield-bearing force that had come under his command from the river Asipus. She went up to him and made her purpose clear. Pandarus, my lord, will you use your wits and take a hint from me? If you could bring yourself to shoot Menelaus with an arrow, you would cover yourself with glory and put every Trojan in your debt, Prince Paris most of all. He would be the first to come forward with a handsome gift if he saw the great Menelaus, son of Atreus, struck down by a shot from you and laid out on a funeral pier. Come, shoot Menelaus in his glory and pray to Archer King Apollo, your own Lycian god. Promise him a splendid sacrifice of firstling lambs when you get home to your sacred city of Zele. Athene's eloquence prevailed upon the fool, and then and there he unsheathed his polished bow. It was made from the horns of an ibex that he himself had shot in the breast. He had lain in wait for the beast and caught it on the breast as it had come out from the cleft of a rock. So it had tumbled into the cleft. The horns on its head, measuring sixteen hands across, were worked up by a craftsman in horn, who fitted them together, made all smooth, and put a golden tip on the end. Pandarus strung the bow, slanting it against the ground, and laid it carefully down, while his followers held their shields in front to protect him from any attack by the fierce Achaeans till he had shot Menelaus, the battle-loving son of Atreus. Then he took the lid off his quiver and picked out an arrow, feathered but as yet unused, and fraught with agony. He deftly fitted the sharp arrow to the string and offered up a prayer to the archer king Apollo, his own Lycian god, promising him a splendid sacrifice of firstling lambs when he should get home to his sacred city of Zalea. And now, gripping the notched end and the ox gut string, he drew them back together till the string was near his breast and the iron point was by the bow. When he had bent the great bow into a circle, it gave a twang, the string sang out, and the sharp arrow leapt into the air, eager to wing its way into the enemy ranks. Ah, but the happy gods that never die did not forget you, Menelaus. Athene above all, the fighting daughter of Zeus, who took her stand in front and warded off the piercing dart, turning it just a little away from the flesh, like a mother driving a fly from her gently sleeping child. With her own hand, she guided it to where the golden buckles of the belt were fixed and the corslet overlapped, so the sharp arrow struck the fastened belt. It drove through the decorated belt and pressed on through the ornate cuirass and through the loin guard that Menelaus wore as a last protection against flying weapons. This did more than all the rest to protect him, yet the arrow sped on through the loin guard too. In the end, it made a shallow wound, and at once the dark blood came flowing from the cut. It was like the purple dye with which some Carian or Meonian woman stains ivory to make the cheek piece for a horse. A lovely ornament that is laid by in store, though every driver longs to see it on his horse. Till one day, it takes the fancy of a king, who buys it to adorn his horse and be a badge of honor for his charioteer. Thus, Menelaus, blood stained your comely thighs and legs and ran down to your shapely ankles. King Agamemnon shuddered when he saw the dark blood streaming from the cut. Indeed, the veteran Menelaus was himself aghast. Though, when he observed the binding and the barbs of the arrowhead had not sunk in, he recovered his composure. But King Agamemnon gave a deep groan and seized him by the hand, while all his men expressed their consternation. My dear brother, cried Agamemnon, it was your death then that I swore to when I made the truce and sent you out to fight alone for us against the Trojans, who have shot you now and trampled on their solemn pact. Yet a pact has been ratified by our hands and solemnized with wine and then the blood of lambs is not so easily annulled. The Olympian may postpone the penalty, but he exacts it in the end, and the transgressors pay a heavy price. They pay with their lives, with their women, and their children too. The day will come, I know it in my heart of hearts, when the holy Ilium will be destroyed, with the Priam and the people of Priam and the good Ashen spear. Zeus, the son of Kronos, from his high seat in heaven where he lives, will wave his somber aegis over all, 
in his anger and perjury of theirs. All this will happen without fail. Yet if you die, Menelaus, if your end has really come, how bitterly I shall lament you, and what a sorry figure I shall cut on my return to thirsty Argos. From the Achaeans will at once be set on getting home. We should be forced to leave Argive, Helen here from the Priam, and his men to boast about, while the earth would rot your bones as you lay in Troy's land with your task undone. I can already hear some Trojan braggarts say, May every quarrel picked by Agamemnon end like this. A futile expedition, retreat in empty ships, and the sterling Menelaus left behind. As he stamps on the tomb of the illustrious Menelaus, that is how they will talk, and I shall pray for the earth to swallow me. But red-haired Menelaus was able to comfort him. Courage, say nothing to dispirit the men. He said, The arrow did not pierce a vital spot. Before it got so far, it was stopped by the metal of my belt, the corselet underneath, and the tunic with the bronze they put on it. If only you are right, my dear Menelaus, exclaimed King Agamemnon. But a physician shall examine the wound and apply ointments to relieve the pain. With that, he turned to Talthybius, his noble messenger. Talthybius, he said, Go as quickly as you can and fetch Machleon. You know the man, the son of the great Ascalyops, to see my lord Menelaus. Some Trojan or Lycian archer, who knows his business well, has shot him with an arrow, to his renown and our misfortune. Agamemnon's squire obediently set out and made his way through the bronze-clad Achaean ranks, searching for the Lord Machaon. He found him, standing with his men, the powerful shield-bearing force that had come under his command from Tricky where the horses graze. He went up to him and delivered his message. Quick, my lord Machaon, King Agamemnon has sent for you to see our great captain. Menelaus, some Trojan or Lycaean archer who knows his business well has struck him with an arrow to his own renown and our misfortune. Stirred by the herald's news, Machaon set off with him and they threaded their way through the tight ranks of the great Achaean army. When they reached the spot where redhead Menelaus lay wounded, with all the chieftains gathered round him in a circle, the admirable Machaon passed through the ring, went up to him, and at once extracted the arrow from the fastened belt, though the pointed barbs broke off the head as it was pulled out. When he found the place where the sharp point had pierced the flesh, he sucked out the blood and skillfully applied a soothing ointment from the supply with which the friendly Chiron had equipped his father. While they were attending to Menelaus of the loud war cry, the Trojan battle lines advanced to the attack. So the Achaeans once more put on their armor and turned to thoughts of war. Agamemnon now showed his mettle. He was at once alert. There was no sign in him of nervous fear, no hesitation to give battle, nothing but eagerness for the fight and glory he might win. He decided not to use his horses in his inlaid chariot, so the pair were laid aside by his squire, snorting as they went. But Agamemnon was careful to instruct the man. It was Eurymedon, son of Ptolemy, to keep them close at hand, in case he grew weary at any point on his long tour of his forces. Then he set out on foot to make the rounds of his army. When he came upon any of the horse-loving Danaeans who were up and marching, he stopped and encouraged them. Argives, he said, You have the right spirit. Do not forget it now. Perjurers will get no help from Father Zeus. The men who went back on their word and broke their truce are going to have their own smooth flesh devoured by vultures while we carry out their little children and the wives they love. On board our ships, we will have sacked their stronghold. On the other hand, any that he found shirking from the ugly business of war came in for a sharp and angry rebuke. Untemptable creatures, he exclaimed, brave only the with the bow. Argives, is there no shame in you? Why do you stand there days like a fawn that dash across the plain and stop when they are tired because they have no spirit? This is what you look like, standing there in a trance instead of fighting. Are you waiting for the Trojans to threaten our good ships on the great sea beach in the hope that Zeus will put his hand out and protect you then? In this way, Agamemnon went the rounds and impressed his will upon the men. In his tour of the compact ranks, he came upon the Cretans, the troops that paraded under the able Idominus. In the forefront was Idominus himself, brave as a boar, while Marines commanded the company in the rear. Agamemnon, king of men, was delighted when he saw them and was quick to compliment their leader. I do menace, he said. Of all my horse-loving Danans, there is not one I count on more than you, not only on the battlefield, but off of it. I throw you this when we sit down to dine, and the gorgeous wine of the elders is mixed in the bowl 
for our best men. When the rest of the long-haired Achaeans have drunk up their portion, your cup stands full, like mine, to drink from as you wish. Off with you in battle, and be the man you've always claimed to be. My lord Atreides, said I, Dominus, the Cretan king, you can rely on my loyal support and the solemn assurance I gave you when this business began. Rouse the rest of the long-haired Achaeans so that we may join battle at once now that the Trojans have broken their oath. As for them, they have nothing to accept but death and disaster, since they went back on their word and broke the truce. Well pleased with this reply, Atreides passed on and made his way through the crowd to the two lords named Ajax. The pair were arming, and the massed infantry behind them loomed like a cloud that a goat herd sees from a lookout. Bang down on him across the sea with the roaring west wind at its back. On it comes, over the sea with the whirlwind in its wake, darkening in the distance till it looks as black as pitch. The goat herd shudders at the sight and drives his flock into a cave. Thus, the gallant youths behind the two Ajaxes moved into battle in their closed formations, dark as a cloud, bristling with shields and spears. King Agamemnon rejoiced when he saw them and paid a signal tribute to the two Ajaxes, saluting them as leaders of his bronze-clad Argives. For you? He said. I have no orders. Exhortations would be out of the place. Your very leadership inspires your men to fight their best. By Father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo, this is the temper I should like to find in all. King Priam's city, captured and sacked by the Achaeans' hands, would soon be razed to the ground. Leaving them with these words, Agamemnon passed on and came to Nestor, the clear-voiced orator from Pylos, whom he found preparing his men for the fighting and marshalling them under their officers, the sturdy Pelagon, Elastor, Chromius, Prince Haemon, and Bias, the great captain. Nestor put his charioteers with the horses and cars in front, and at the back, a mass of first-rate infantry to serve as rearguard. In between, he stationed his inferior troops, so that even the shirkers would be forced to fight. He told his charioteers, whom he instructed first, to hold in their horses and not get entangled in the melee. Do not think that his bravery and skill entitle a charioteer to break the ranks and fight the Trojans on his own, he said. And don't let anybody drop behind and weaken the whole force. When a man in his own chariot comes within reach of an enemy car, it is time for him to try a spear thrust. Those are the best tactics. This is the discipline and spirit that enabled our forefathers to take walled towns by storm. Thus the old man used the experience he had gained in battles long ago to inspire his troops. It warmed King Agamemnon's heart to watch him, and he told him what he felt. My venerable lord, he said, How happy I could be if your admiral's spirit were matched by the vigor of your limbs and the strength were unimpaired. But age, which no one can escape, lies heavy on you. If only you could pass it on to someone else and join the ranks of you. My lord Atreides, said Nestor, the Gerenian nobleman. I too could wish most heartily to be the man I was when I killed the great Arithalian. But the gods did not grant us all their favors at a single time. I was a young man then. Now age oppresses me. Yet for all that, I shall be with my charioteers and in command. Their plans and orders come from me. It is the privilege of age. Even if the handling of the spears is left to younger men than myself with the vigor needed for the work. Content with what he had seen of Nestor, Agamemnon resumed his tour. The next he visited was Petios' son, Menestheus, tamer of horses. This man and his Athenian troops, whose battle cry was famous, were standing idle. And close beside them was Odysseus of the Nimble Wits with his Cephalenians, a substantial force, but also standing easy. The call to battle had not reached their ears, for the Trojan and Achaean regiments had only just begun to move into action. So they stood and waited for some other Achaean battalion to advance against the Trojans and begin the fight. When he noticed this, King Agamemnon gave them a severe rebuke. You, sir, he said. Menasius, a son of a royal father, and you, Odysseus, arch intriguer, always look into your own advantage. Why are you hanging back like this and leaving others to advance? It is for you to take a stand in the front line and welcome the shock of battle. Are you not the first to get my invitation when a banquet for the leading captains is afoot? On such occasions, you are quite content to take your fill of roasted meat and mellow wine. But now you seem content to watch while ten battalions of Archeans fall on the enemy before you make a move. 
The resourceful Odysseus gave him a black look. My lord Atreides, he replied. This is absurd. Can you maintain that in a pitched battle we ever loiter in the rear? You shall have your wish, if that is what is troubling you, and see the father of Telemachus at grips with the front rank of these horse-taming Trojans. Meanwhile, you are talking nonsense. When King Agamemnon saw that Odysseus had taken umbrage, he smiled at him and apologized. Royal son of Laertes, Odysseus of the Nimbowitz, I do not blame you overmuch. I shall spur you on no more, for I know that in your heart you are well disposed toward me. In fact, we see eye to eye, but enough. Later I will make amends, and anything uncivil I may have said just now, let God wipe it out. With this, he left them there and went in search of others. The next he came upon was Tydeus' son, the great-hearted Diomedes, who was standing in his well-made chariot with the horses yoked. Stenelus, son of Capaneus, stood close at hand. King Agamemnon looked at Diomedes and took him sharply to task. What does this mean? He asked. The son of Tedius, the dauntless charioteer, shirking the battle, watching the way it goes? It was not Tedius' habit to shrink back, but to sally out in front of all his friends and come to grips. That is what people say who saw the man at work. They say he was superb. I never knew him or set eyes on him, though he did come to Mycenae once, not as an enemy, but on a friendly visit with Prince Melanesis in search of reinforcements. It was a time of their expeditions against Thebes of the sacred walls. They begged our people very hard for adequate support, and we promised all they asked for. But Zeus made us change our minds, showing inauspicious omens, and they left Mycenae. When they've gone some way and reached the deep meadows and reedy banks of Asibus, the Akin commander sent Tydeus forward for a parley. He went to Thebes and found a large party of Cadmians at dinner in the palace of the Prince Eteocles. Now as a visitor, alone among the crowd of strangers, even the gallant Tydeus might have felt some qualms. But not at all. He challenged them to friendly matches and won easily in every case with Athena's generous help. They nettled the horse-racing Cadmians, and when Tydeus left, they sent ahead and laid an ambush in his path. Forty men with two officers, Maon, son of Haemon, a man of rank, and a hardened killer called Polyphontes, whose father had been too deadly. But Tydeus dealt with them and brought with them to an ugly end. He killed the whole party, but for one, who he sent home. He had a warning from the gods and left Maon off. That, sir, was Aetolian Tydeus. You are his son. You do not fight as he did, though you may be better when it comes to talking. The staunch Diomedes made no reply to this harangue, but accepted the rebuke from the sovereign he revered. But the son of the illustrious Capenius could not keep his quiet. My lord, he said, you know the facts. Do not distort them. I claim that we are far better men than our fathers. We did succeed in capturing seven gated Thebes. With a weaker force, we stormed more powerful defenses than they ever faced because we put our faith in Zeus and the signs that the gods sent us, whereas they came to grief through their own presumption. So never talk to me about our fathers in the same breath as ourselves. Diomedes interposed with an angry glance at Stenelus. Quiet, Stenelus. Take your cue from me. I shall not quarrel with Agamemnon, our commander, for spurring on his troops. It is he who shall get the credit if we defeat the Trojans and capture Holy Ilium. But if the Achaeans are defeated, he shall suffer the most. Come, it is time for war. With that, he jumped down from his chariot in all his armor. As he leapt into action, the bronze rang grimly on the prince's breast. The stoutest heart might well have been dismayed. And now, battalion on battalion of Danaeans swept relentlessly into battle like great waves that come hurtling onto an echoing beach on top of one another, under a westerly gale. Far out at sea, their crests begin to rise. Then they come in and crash down onto the shingle with a mighty roar, or arch themselves to break in on a cliff and send the sea foam flying. Each of the captains shouted his orders to his own command, but the men moved quietly. They obeyed their officers without a sound and came on behind them like an army of the mute. The metaled armor that they marched in glittered on every man. It was otherwise with the Trojans. They were like the sheep that stand in their thousands in a rich farmer's yard, yielding their white milk and bleeding incessantly because they hear their lambs. Such was the din that went up from the great Trojan army which hailed from many parts, and being without a common language used many different cries and calls. Ares, the god of war, spurred on the Trojan forces. Athene of the flashing eyes, the Achaeans. 
Karen Panic Red Hand, and so is Strife, the War God's sister who helps him in his bloody work. Once she begins, she cannot stop. At first, she seems a little thing, but before long, though her feet are still on the ground, her head has struck high heaven. She swept in now among the Trojans and Achaeans, filling them with hatred of one another. It was the groans of dying men she wished to hear. At last, the armies met with a clash of buckler spears and bronze-clad fighting men. The bosses of their shields collided, and a great roar went up. The screams of the dying were mingled with the taunts of their destroyers, and the earth ran with blood. So, in winter, two mountain rivers flowing in spate from the great springs higher up mingle their torts at a confluence in some deep ravine, and far off in the hills a shepherd hears their thunder. Such was the tumult and turmoil as the two armies came to grips. Antilochus was the first to kill his man, Echepolis, son of Thessalius, who was fighting in full armor in the Trojan front. With the first cast, he struck his man on the ridge of his crested helmet. The spear point, landing in his forehead, pierced the bone. Darkness came down on his eyes, and he crashed in the melee like a falling power. It was scarcely down when Prince Elephenor, son of Calcodon and leader of the Fiery Abantes, seized him by the foot and tried to drag him quickly out of range to spoil him of his armor, an enterprise he did not carry far for the valiant Agenor saw him dragging the corpse away. With his bronze-headed shaft, Agenor caught him on the flank, which his shield had left exposed as Elefnor stooped. The man collapsed, and over his lifeless body a grim struggle ensued between the Trojans and Achaeans. They leapt at each other like wolves, and men tossed men about. It was now that Telamonian Ajax struck down Anthemion's son, Simoesius. This sturdy youngster took his name from the river Simois, beside which he was born when his mother was returning from Mount Ida, where her father and mother had taken her to see their sheep. His life was too short for him to repay his parents for their loving care, for it ended when he met great Ajax's spear. He had scarcely sallied out when Ajax struck him in the breast by the right nipple. The bronze spear went clean through his shoulder, and he fell down in the dust chopped down like a slender poplar with a bushy top that is shot up by the big meadows in a stream and is cut down by a wheelwright with a gleaming axe. Later the man will make spokes from it for the wheels of a beautiful chariot, but he leaves it now to lie and season by the bank. Thus King Ajax felled Simoesius, Anthemian's son. And now Priam's son Antiphus in his shivering cuirass aimed a sharp javelin across the crowd at Ajax himself. Antiphus missed his man, but he made a hit, for he caught Lucas, one of Odysseus' comrades, in the groin as he was dragging Simoesius away. The body fell from Lucas' hands, and he himself came crashing down upon it. Odysseus was infuriated when he saw Lucas killed. In his glittering bronze equipment, he made his way to the front ranks, right up to the enemy line, where he took his stand, and after one look around, let fly with his shining javelin. The Trojans leapt back when they saw it coming, but Odysseus had not cast in vain. He struck Demoukhan, a bastard son of Priam's, who had joined him from his stud farm in Abydus, only to fall to the spear that Odysseus had cast in anger at his comrade's death. Bronze Point struck Demoukhan on the temple and came out the other. Night descended on his eyes. He fell with a thud, and his armor rang out. Illustrious Hector and the whole Trojan front fell back, while the Argive shouted in triumph, dragging the corpses in and advancing still further. This filled Apollo, who was watching from Pergamus with indignation, and he called aloud to the Trojans. On with you, Trojan charioteers. Never give our guys victory in battle. They are not made of stone or iron. Their flesh cannot keep out the penetrating bronze when they are hit. And what is more, the son of Thetis of the lovely locks Achilles is not fighting. He is sulking by the ships. Thus, the redoubtable god encouraged them from his citadel, while the Achaeans were emboldened by Athene, daughter of Zeus, the august lady of Triton, who went through the ranks herself and spurred on any laggard she saw. And now, Diores, son of Amarynchius, was caught in the toils of fate. He was hit by a jagged stone on the right leg near the ankle. The man who threw it was the Thracian captain Pyro, son of Ambracius, who had come from Enus. The brutal rock shattered the two sinews and the bones. And Diores fell backwards in the dust, stretching his hands out to his friends and gasping for breath. But Pyrrhos, the man who had hit him, ran up and struck him by the navel with his spear. His entrails poured out on the ground, and night descended on his eyes. As Pyrrhos sprang away, Aetolian Thoas hit him in the chest with a spear below the nipple, and the bronze point sank into his lung. 
Thoas came up to him, pulled the heavy weapon from his breast, and drawing his sharp sword, struck him full in the belly. He took Pyrrhus's life, but he did not get his armor. For Pyrrhus's men, the Thracians, with their topknots on their heads, surrounded him. They held their long spears steady in their hands and fended Thoas off, big, strong, and formidable though he was. Thoas was shaken and withdrew. So these two, Pyrrhus and Diores, were stretched out in the dust at each other's side. Both of them were chieftains, one of the Thracians and the other of the bronze-clad Apeans. But they were not the only people killed. Indeed, this was no idle skirmish. A newcomer, as yet unfamiliar with the ways of war, would have soon found that out. Had Athene shielded him from the hail of missiles and led him by hand into the thick of the fray. It was a day when many Trojans and Achaeans bit the dust and were stretched out side by side.